Hello everyone and welcome back to Strategy Gaming Dojo where we find, learn, and play one more turn of the great strategy games. Now today we are continuing on with our Let's Play of Gary Grigsby's War in the Pacific Admirals Edition. This is episode number 11 and we've reached a milestone and that milestone is both that we've gotten to Pearl Harbor and that also means we've set up over half of the units. Now you may you you may get a chuckle out of that because if you're playing along at home, uh, it seems like we have set up a lot of units. Uh, well, around 2,000 I think is about the halfway mark down the spreadsheet, and we are officially over the 2,000 mark. Uh, we are also into the H's. Uh, this time we're going to call it Hawaii as opposed to saying Pearl Harbor. Of course, Pearl Harbor is the big, big kahuna, if you will, in Hawaii. Uh, but there are a few other things going on in Hawaii, and we'll go over those. And also Midway uh, is kind of wrapped up into Hawaii here. So yes, we are progressing along. Now, if you're like me, you enjoy the setup. We probably wouldn't be interested in this game unless we liked those finer details, getting down into, you know, this unit in Hawaii or that unit in Burma and thinking about those things. And, you know, you learn quite a bit, right? I, I have learned a massive amount of information about World War II through playing this game, getting to know the units or the ships and thinking about them uh, and why they were where they were and why they went where they went. So anyway, we will be setting up Pearl Harbor. There are also some really interesting things. I actually this time decided to save a few things to do along with you because I thought they were things that maybe we didn't cover as much in the uh, basic tutorial. It just you know was above and beyond what you would do in a, in a basic tutorial, but are really important game mechanics nonetheless. You might guess, you know, here at Pearl Harbor, we will be looking at ship repair. Uh, there is a lot of ship repair to do. And of course, uh, you know, let's all hope in this playthrough, this is the most ship repair that we'll have to decide about in one turn at one location <laughs> for the entire game. Maybe not accurate, you know, over in the Dutch East Indies, it's possible we may, you know, see some similar circumstances, but hopefully we never have a situation with, you know, four, five, five battleships over 50 float damage. Um, but we'll get into all this repair. And uh, like I said, I saved it. I haven't, I haven't uh, done any of the repair stuff. So we'll kind of go through it. I'll tell you my thought process, which hey, it's just my thought process. Is it right or is it, is it wrong? I don't know. It's the way I think about these things. And, you know, you can take that as you will and then maybe think about how you want to repair ships or kind of the priority in repairing ships. So we'll get into that this episode. There are other interesting things. We've got, you know, subs. We've got uh, two carrier task forces that we deal with here. And I say two carrier task forces, maybe I should have been more excited about that because we've got two of the three carrier, carrier task forces that the United States Navy has at this point. And, uh, you know, the carriers, I don't know, maybe you're different, uh, but the carriers, I get excited when I look at the carrier groups. They, they're kind of cool, right? Like I said last time, they're the, they're the lion of the Serengeti out here. They're the big task forces that are, you know, what eventually kind of tips the balance of power because they can project air power anywhere that they want to, you know, within reason, of course. But with a good task force built around your carriers, you can go pretty much anywhere and do what you want. And the United States Navy has operated that way ever since about 1943 to the modern day. So it's kind of interesting to look at these carriers and see you know, how, how the task force is made up, what kind of planes are on them. <clears throat> now I will say with that, what I just said, 
early in this war, early in the Pacific War in World War II, we are at a major disadvantage uh, as carriers. Now you'll see we're hightailing it out of here with the uh, Lexington, but we are not uh, as good as the Japanese. Our pilots are not, our planes are not. The Japanese have a decided advantage. So we're gonna be playing peekaboo with our, car our carriers early in the war. You know, we're gonna bring the Lexington, and I do actually, uh, again, I don't wanna say disagree. It's not that I disagree. I just do something a little different with my carriers than what Cole does. I'm a lot more cautious with this carrier group. I bring them way south and around before I bring them back to Pearl Harbor. Um, now, in this December 8th scenario, and this leads me to a bigger point that I wanted to bring up in this episode, in this scenario, the Enterprise is right here at port at Pearl Harbor. I think maybe in the December 7th scenario, that is not the case because historically they were not, you know, at port in Pearl Harbor, right? They were out sailing around to the benefit of the U.S. war effort to be sure uh, because these are a lot of high value ships. You know, let's just look at them very quickly. Enterprise, you've got three heavy cruisers. You've got a lot of destroyers out here in that Enterprise group. So anyway, the larger point that I wanted to say is it's now come up that there are a few units as we've been going through here. And in particular, uh, uh, the 113th Base Force that is back at San Diego or is supposed to be back at San Diego. There are a few units that are not appearing. So they're on the spreadsheet. They're not where they're supposed to be. Um, and that really is because we're playing the December 8th scenario. I've checked, you know, I've looked here and it, there's a few different things going on. One is the December 7th grand campaign scenario is the, you know, big scenario for this game. That is the marquee scenario, the big grand campaign starting December 7th. We are playing the one that starts December 8th, of course. So it's very possible with an older game like this that there have been, you know, in the patches, in the updates, in the, the uh, improvements since the game came out, that some things have been corrected, updated, put in the right place at the start or something. In the grand campaign, the scenario number one, December 7th campaign, because it's the marquee, right? And maybe those same updates didn't quite make it into the December 8th game. Now I hold out hope that the 113th Base Force is going to show up in San Diego or LA in the next turn or two. Hopefully it will. But if it does not, we will adjust. Now that was supposed to go to Nomaya, I think. Um, and we will just have to figure out a different Base Force to go there, or we'll have to improvise a little bit. And I know as war gamers, that's not always the easiest thing to do. You're like, where's this Base Force? Holy crap. Uh, believe me, I looked for it for like 20 minutes yesterday. I looked all through the database. I think I clicked on everything in the West Coast. And I was like, where in the world is this 113th Base Force? It's just not in this December 8th scenario right now. I'm not saying it won't show up, but it's not there right now. So just something to keep in mind is we are playing a different scenario than what the spreadsheet uh, is keying off of. Now, from what I've seen and what I've seen in the past, 99.8 uh, of the units are exactly the same. They're in exactly the same place, but there are a few. I mean, we've set up, what, 2,200 units at this point, and I know that there are maybe three or four, maybe even a few more than that, that aren't either in exactly the same place or aren't on the database. Now, I think there are only two I've found that aren't on the database. We can list them out. <clears throat> I know some of the people that have been, you know, playing along and setting up uh, with me have identified some of those. So, you know, put them in the comments and, 
maybe we're just not looking in the right place, but uh, a couple of these I have not been able to find in the database, but it's not a huge deal. We'll just improvise. We'll figure something else out. Uh, but let's go ahead and get a running list of those going just because I'm kind of curious. So that was kind of my big meta point that I wanted to bring up early in this episode. Uh, we will be looking at the carriers, both carrier groups. Uh, also, another thing I left for this episode is the Indianapolis out here. So the heavy cruiser Indianapolis is not exactly where it was on December 7th. And that's the other category of how we may be differing a little bit from the spreadsheet is when it comes to some ships some things they're not maybe in exactly the same hex i think maybe on the december 7th and maybe on the spreadsheet the indianapolis is in port at pearl harbor obviously you know by december 8th it ran out of port uh to get away from the attacks and now it's got the uh it's got the orders built in by the game at the start to go back to Pearl Harbor. Uh, but I'm gonna use this as kind of one of those moments where we, we talk about something that if I would have made intermediate or advanced tutorials, we would have talked about, which is splitting up task forces and how you do that very easily and send these things on their way to meet with another task force in the case of the Indianapolis and these uh, these mine, these destroyer minesweepers, they're kind of hybrids. They can, they operate like a destroyer. They've got some anti-sub, uh, but they're also minesweepers. We'll talk about that in this episode. I thought it was kind of an interesting topic that we can look at. That and the ship repair will be my like big general, hey, this is, we're now into intermediate advanced land. Let's talk about these that were not talked about in the tutorial. So anyway, uh, there are a few other things going on here uh, in the Hawaiian region. And let's talk about those really fast. Uh, uh, Hilo down here, uh, we have, you know, a couple of units, okay? We are building everything at Hilo. So we're expanding the port, expanding the airfield, expanding the fortifications. The real reason for that is, you know, this is going to be your main base at the southern tip of the Hawaiian Islands. Also, you know, if we take a step back for a second and we think about expanding fortifications, expanding airfields, expanding ports, uh, especially ports, we've been talking about that in places where we said, well, you know, I mean, is it really worth the supplies it's going to cost or the time it's going to take? You know, is this something in danger by the Japanese or are we just, you know, are we going to have to send extra cargo task forces there to get enough supply to like, you know, build up the port? When you're talking about a place like Hilo, that none of those considerations really matter. There is so much supply coming into Hawaii that that objection just doesn't exist, okay? Uh, you're not going to say, well, let's not expand the port because I don't want to expend the supplies or take the time to do it. Uh, you know, ultimately, look, do we expect that the Japanese are going to come and try to take Hilo? Not really, although I've seen it happen, <laughs> to be honest with you. I have seen the Hawaiian Islands under full attack. Uh, and, you know, and there's the, I guess the main point here is there's no reason not to build this up on the southern tip island here. There's no reason not to have one of these two bases being built into something a little more formidable than 2-1, right? We might as well take this up and with the fortifications, you know, keep building those fortifications, you know, take the port to something bigger, because let's just say the Japanese turn around and put on a full on assault against Pearl Harbor and they start to hit the airfield and they, you know, wear down our fortifications. Um, it, it's nice to have a second one or third one, depending on what we do at Lahaina. You know, it's nice to have that and there's no reason not to. Yeah, all of the objections that maybe we have at other places don't really exist here, okay? Um, that brings me also to another, I, I always say this, hey, that brings me to another point, but it's true. I mean, there's just 
a lot of points in this game, um, we do not see the Japanese task force that attacked Pearl Harbor. Now that is called the Kitty The Kitty is the task force that sailed over from Japan and launched these attacks. Now we have no planes in the air to speak of. Uh, we have some subs, you know, that are out here. We have the Indianapolis. You know, if we go a little further, we have the Lexington in the area. Here's actually another sub. So we've got five subs, but we have we don't have any recon of where they might be. Now, one of the main things we're doing out of Pearl Harbor is sending a massive amount of air groups up. You know, they're, we're sending up recon, we're sending up cap, we're sending up naval attack, we're sending up just a ton of air to, you know, protect now, right? We were taken off guard and Pearl Harbor was hit. We didn't have any planes in the air. The Japanese dealt us a, a very harsh blow. Day after, believe me, that is not going to happen again. Now, they have better planes than we do. They have better pilots than we do at this point. But they are not, they're going to, they would have an almost impossible time of coming back and trying to hit again. Now, remember, we have got, uh, you know, 118 ships in port. We have a carrier here, a carrier group here. But we have 118 ships that are just sitting here. We have battleships, cruisers, light cruisers, a ton of destroyers. We have tankers. You know, we've got everything here, right? A lot of high value targets. Um, and we have not even formed them into task forces. And you may have asked yourself, well, why is that? Why, why have we not formed these things up? Well, the reason being is, is that Japanese task force is either here and we just can't see them or they've maybe sailed here or maybe they're here or maybe they're steaming over here towards midway they are still in the area so just because you can't see them don't be fooled that they're not here somewhere close and in addition to that that a lot of Japanese subs are not on the way there are Japanese subs on the way to ring around Pearl Harbor. This huge Kitty Butai task force um, is somewhere in area. Now, historically, they went north. Uh, they would be right up in here historically. We'll see what the AI has done. We'll know very quickly after the next turn because we are sending a vast majority of especially the fighters up to run cap over Pearl Harbor. Um, we have dive bombers out. We are going to have uh, other bombers out running ASW. We've got a lot of air assets that are you know, being put up because we cannot take the chance or allow the Japanese to come back and get a second shot. They might be better than us. We may take two to one losses out here, and that would be okay because we can replace the planes. Uh, but if they come back in and take out a carrier uh, and more, you know, a few more battleships, it's going to be much, much harder to recover. <clears throat> so we have put a bunch of planes in the air. So anyway, uh, we talked about Hilo. We're building that up. I did want to make this, you know, this point, but we'll get back to it here when we get back to Pearl Harbor. Now let's go out to Johnston Island. Johnston Island is something that I think good players can disagree about. Um, I try to pump as much into Johnston Island as I can. Uh, I do not want in any way, shape, or form the Japanese to think that they can come here to Johnston Island. It's just too close of a staging base. <clears throat> you know, this you have to have in my opinion, uh, some fences. You know, you got to have that Iron Curtain, Iron Crescent. To me, that does not really run to Pearl Harbor. It runs up here to Johnston Island. Uh, and then also around a Midway. I try to fortify Midway 
actually pretty quickly, I know that there are good allied players that say, ah, who cares about Midway? Or, you know, maybe some people that don't want to mess with the fact that the Kitty Butai may run up here to Midway. But that's fine. You can let them clear. They may be sending an attacking force. I mean, we're not that far away. Now, see, Wake, I don't, you know, Wake seems far enough away to me. It's also parallel to already Japanese-controlled islands. But once you get to Johnston or Midway, I just think it's a little close. Uh, it's not that Johnston's a great base. You know, it's a one port, a two airfield. They're not going to be launching anything out of here. But it does give them kind of a safe haven to bring in some, uh, some support ships. Um, you know, some ships, they can have kind of a floating gas station out here. Um, I just don't like it. So anyway, in Johnston, we have got this uh, patrol group, uh, one flying in the morning, one flying in the afternoon, because we have two. Um, yeah, so we've got search 50. We got two. One flies in the morning, one flies in the afternoon. <clears throat> out here going directly west to hopefully, you know, see anything that may be headed our way, anything we have to worry about uh, out here. We've already got some Marines out here. Uh, this is the Defense Battalion, the Johnson Defense Battalion. You can always tell the Marines they've got the little anchor, you know, they're in blue. So we've got a Defense Battalion of Marines. We have some engineers out here. We also... Um, have some ASW that we're, we're uh, actually sending down to Palmyra here. Uh, the, part of the reason is that this would be pretty exposed for a single ship out here. It's got no protection whatsoever. And also, we're not really running a ton of task forces over here. What we are running are those uh, continuous supply missions uh, with one or two point cargo ships you know if a japanese sub gets one of them it's it's not great but we don't we have a limited amount of asw and we need that the asw that's up here down at palmyra a little bit more so johnston we're building fortifications we're expanding the port uh, we do want that port to get a little bigger because we don't want other ships sitting here trying to unload things to the extent that we want to start building this up because this will be a hop, skip, and a jump for us, right? When we start going back west, uh, Johnston Island, we can use as a little hopping off point. So we want to build that uh, port up as well. And so that's Johnston. I wanted to look at that. Uh, let's go back up to Lahaina. Now, Lahaina is kind of the second sister to uh, Pearl Harbor. You know, it's got a potential level 7 airfield. It's already got a level 4 port. That's not bad. So if Pearl Harbor does come under threat or has been attacked and we can't get stuff into Pearl Harbor, Lahaina is not a great, but it's not a terrible alternative. Uh, but you know, it's pretty close in proximity, right? And that's why I say we, you know, building up Hilo makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, Lahaina's got some stuff. It's got six ships in port. <clears throat> oh, and that, that brings me back to the bigger point I was making a minute ago. At Pearl Harbor, we didn't put together a lot of these task forces because we just don't really know where the Japanese task force is. And it makes no sense to put together a task force and send it somewhere and have it run right into the main Japanese task force and get blown out of the water. So most of these guys are turtling at Pearl Harbor until we can get recon up, until we know where the Japanese Kitty Butai is. Once we, let's just say that they do what they did historically, come up north and head west. Once we know that and we get eyes on them, now that is going to be a little imperfect. We're playing with fog of war. And as the game starts, we'll start to look at our intelligence reports and start to read what people are telling us. Um, but if we get enough confirmed reports that the Japanese are up here, or if they sell uh, directly west, that they're out here, then we'll start forming these task forces. 
we'll start sending things back to the mainland or we'll start sending supply down here. Now, as you see, Pearl Harbor starts with 183 in supply, 183,000 that is, and 610,000 in fuel. That is a lot, but we're gonna need all we can get out here. That's why we're running task forces out here from the mainland continuously, 118 ships. That doesn't even count all of this down here and all of the other stuff we're gonna be bringing out here. So we wanna build that up as much as possible. So anyway, we talked about Hilo, building that up. Lahaina, we're building that up. Uh, we do have you know, some ship support here, including two tankers, uh, also a transport ship, which we are in deep, deep um, deficit in. We need all of the transport ships we can get. Uh, I didn't look, but I, I'm, would just say off the top of my head, we're, we'll be sending this back to San Francisco or LA to pick things, units up, maybe even aircraft. We'll see what we uh, see when we get back there. Um, these AGs, you know, they're auxiliaries. They're like gun uh, ammunition boats, but they, these are called miscellaneous, so they can kind of be anything you want them to be. Uh, but these tankers, pretty pretty nice capacity on this Gulf Hawk. It's got a short range. It'll probably just be running Vancouver, Seattle, uh, possibly San Francisco to Pearl. But that's Lahaina. Let's move out to Midway. Um, Midway is an interesting situation. Uh, it's it's not a great base. You know, it's a one four, so the airfield has been built. Now you see we're running patrol east dead east. And why is that? Because we know the Kitty Butai is probably right, going to be coming right through here, maybe even straight up to here to hit Midway on its way back uh, to get rearmed, to get refueled. Um, so we're running that off here. We are holding the ship in port because again, we have no idea where that task force is. But I can tell you, uh, you know, I probably value Midway a little bit more than the typical or average allied player. I know some people, as I said earlier, that it's just not a big deal, you know. They're, they're like, you're probably going to lose Midway anyway. I will be running up here to reinforce Midway as fast as I can because I don't see any reason to lose something this far to the east if you don't have to. And this is something you could potentially save if you get assets up here. So I will be doing that. Um, you know, in Cole's spreadsheet, I don't think he really takes a, uh, a position on that because it's the first turn and mostly, you know, you're just diving back into your turtle shell until the big Japanese task force passes by. Now we do have these subs out here and these subs, uh, this one is going to be going north of Midway looking for that task force. It's going to be sitting here waiting. Hopefully, hey, look, who knows? You know, I've seen crazy things happen. Hopefully getting a torpedo off at a, sh a high value ship. Now it could also, you know, just hit a support ship worth two points, or it could hit something and it not explode. Because if we look at the Argonaut, um, which tor Oh, it's carrying the Mark 10s, <clears throat> which are actually a better torpedo than the later Mark 14s. So, hey, you know, who knows? Who knows? That could be fun. Uh, imagine hitting a carrier. I've seen crazier things happen. So we're going to sit this up here, kind of, you know, uh, just laying in wait, a little bit of an ambush. Now, this sub I find really interesting, and I definitely want to talk about it. Now, I've named this Sub Patrol Sakalin, okay? This is the SS Trout. It's got a pretty good endurance, right? Um, the Trout does carry Mark 14 torpedoes, so query whether it's going to explode if we hit anything. But the reason I really wanted to talk about this is we're taking the Trout straight up here to the Japanese home islands and just north of Honshu, uh, up here to Sakhalin. This 
you know, is likely to be a place where some shipping would go through. Now, if you're, you know, the Japanese and you're trying to supply these little bases out here, you may say, well, I don't want to take them here. There are probably subs here. I'll take them, you know, around the back where I probably have better visibility and we'll come right through here. Well, as the allied player, that's what we're trying to hit, right? But that's not even necessarily what makes this uh, interesting other than we're up near the Japanese home islands. What it is is that we have set the home port to Dutch Harbor. Now we talked about this when we set up Alaska and that is the fact these Aleutian Island bases are actually you know a lot closer than you think of them being to Japan or at least to Japanese bases. You know we're talking a, a fair distance right I mean the Pacific is huge these are big distances but you know 40 80 blah blah blah, blah, blah. we're talking like 500 miles maybe um, out here to a two but remember we set up this little floating or we are going to be setting up this floating submarine tender out here uh, that's that auxiliary ship for subs at Dutch Harbor this is why because this sub if it should get damaged or just normal wear and tear, instead of having to go all the way back to the you know Central Pacific Ocean to Pearl Harbor, instead, if it gets hurt, it can limp back here to Dutch Harbor. Um, and so we will be building this up with that sub tender. They can rearm back here. Um, We'll hopefully, you know, get this Dutch Harbor built up a little bit, uh, but that's why we're doing that. It can always come back here, and that will be its main base. Um, okay, so I, that, I think, really brings us to Pearl Harbor, the big enchilada, the, you know, the, the main reason Hawaii is important is this massive base at Pearl Harbor. It's a seven. We're trying to take it to an eight. It's got the largest airfield available in the game, which is a 10. It's got a massive amount of supply and a massive amount of fuel. Now, the reason being is, of course, that before the war started, the Americans had some inkling that the Japanese had designs in the Pacific. Now, did they think they would directly attack Pearl Harbor? You know, you can read books that say maybe Delano, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt knew more than he let on. But be that as it may, the Americans generally knew that the Japanese had designs on American colonial areas out in the Pacific and definitely British, uh, Australian, you know, New Zealand colonial areas out in the Pacific. And so they had built this this base out in Pearl Harbor up thinking, well, if they attack our positions in the Philippines or at Guadalcanal or someplace like that, we need to have a big base over here in the Pacific. You know, not a lot of people, I think, thought that the Japanese would be daring enough to come ta attack the major United States fleet at Pearl Harbor. But this was already the huge base for the United States in the Pacific. So, you know, there is a lot of stuff here. There is a lot of aircraft. If we look, you know, down here at the airfield and look at all of this aircraft, you'll see all of these fighters <clears throat> that we have their primary mission as escort. But of course, they will be running a lot of cap. We will be peeling off 70%, you know, uh, of this group, 80%, 70%, and they will be flying protective missions. Now, if you set this up along with the coal spreadsheet, you'll notice those are flying at a, you know, a bunch of different altitudes. We have people flying at 25,000, 21,000, 20, 17, 18, 19. He does that for a reason. We want to, you know, have fighters kind of at every layer. And if, uh, because the Japanese have a ton of aircraft over here. You know, they could send hundreds, you know, a, f a couple of hundred at least aircraft back towards Pearl Harbor. And we are not as good as the Japanese. So let's just, you know, make up something. This Mohawk uh, squadron, if they're at 15,000 feet, 
and they start to engage the uh, Japanese Zeros at 15,000 feet, we want to have a lot of aircraft we can bring down from a higher altitude. Because uh, when it comes to the fighting game, when it comes to fighters in a dogfight, you have an advantage if you're coming from above. Uh, you also want to be able to spot aircraft at all different altitudes. And so that's another reason to layer. You know, we're, we're layering literally from 10,000 feet up to 20,000 feet plus fighters all along the way. And we can, you know, go look at some of these. These guys are at 17,000 feet, okay? Um, you know, if we look at another one, these guys are at 21,000 feet. And it just keeps going. We kind of have some a squadron sort of at every 1,000 foot. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so the purpose for that, again, really is spotting. And then if we do get into a dogfight, we've got a lot of help that's coming from above no matter kind of what the altitude is that the Japanese are coming in. Because if they are running a bombing mission, they're not going to be up at 20,000 feet anyway. They would be down at 10,000 feet or below, generally speak, speaking. Now, that doesn't mean they couldn't be running a cap, uh, well, when I say a cap, a long-range cap over the top of that. Uh, but even then, we've got a lot of planes that would be coming down, because that would probably be at, let's say, 15,000 feet, 12,000 feet, we will have the advantage even though we've got inferior planes and pilots. And most of these pilots have very little experience. And so we, we would really prefer they not get into a scrap. Uh, but if they do, we want to try to give them as many advantages as possible. And so rather than go through every single air squadron, you know, you can kind of see it here on the screen. We've got, um, you know, anti-sub stuff going on. We've got some training. You know, some of the guys that are like at 35 or 40 experience or maybe even 50, these guys are these, you know, you see this a lot. These 50, 50 guys, they're not going to do a whole lot for you out there. I guess I could have looked right here, right? We've got the experience. Uh, we've got a lot of 50 experience. Um, you know, we're going to be trying to train these guys up the best that we can. But unfortunately, out here at Pearl Harbor right now, we don't have a we don't have much of a choice. We've got to get aircraft up because we have to dissuade the Japanese from running a bombing run on us. So that's kind of what's happening in the air war here. Uh, these subs while I'm here, you'll see what we've done. We're bringing these subs. Uh, for the most part, right here. That's in case the Japanese get some kind of crazy idea to come back down here, right? So we're kind of forming a little wall of what subs we have available. Now, eventually, these subs are going to go over <clears throat> to the Marshall Islands, maybe over to Australia. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we have various places they may go, but right now anyway we need them right here um with that i think i'm gonna come talk about yeah let's talk about the enterprise really fast now most of the planes on the secondary ships if we look down here <clears throat> we will be running a general naval search with them And that's really for, like, all of these secondary uh, ships that have any kind of planes, we will be running a naval search, generally at 50%, with no arc set. That's just to get them up in the air. I will tell you there's a special rule. When uh, an aircraft carrier or any other kind of ship is in a port, they run these at, like, 50% of the 50, right? <clears throat> there's just kind of a special rule that goes into uh, if you're at port, because if you think about it, an aircraft carrier, 99% of the time is not going to be running air missions off of its deck if it's sitting at anchor in a port. You know, think, think if you've ever seen an aircraft carrier come back into San Diego or come back into Pearl Harbor, if you've been out there or anywhere in the world, I guess. You know, 
you don't see too many air missions being run off of the decks of those aircraft carriers when they're in port. Um, so anyway, there's kind of a special rule about that. Uh, so don't think that just because you're at a port that this is going to be running a true 50%. Okay, just something I wanted to mention. Um, let's go back to the main ship here, the Enterprise. Um, and let's look at, you know, the Wildcat. We're getting the Wildcat up, this group. We've got 18 nice fighters here. Uh, we're going to be running them up on cap 60%. Uh, again, you know, their primary mission is always escort, but we're peeling a full 6 and 10 of these planes out to run cap. They're at 15,000 feet. Um, let's go back over here. Let's look at the Dauntlesses. Uh, I do believe we're running naval attack on them. Naval attack, secondary mission rest. Uh, we have them going a specific place. Again, you know, they're not going to be running these missions like they would if we were out at sea because they are in at port. But we're not going to take this out of port right now. We need all the defense of this we can get because this is a high value target for that Japanese task force out there. Uh, these Dauntless is doing the same thing with some search. Um, and they're, they're going directly north with these uh, planes. 18 of these Dauntlesses. Uh, going north. That's also why we have a lot of these fighters on escort. They will, you know, be running escort in case these planes find something up there. Um, you know, we may get into a scrap right off the right off the bat. Uh, so let's go back. So those Dauntlesses are this way. Our our torpedo bombers. Um, you know, so we have our devastators here. They are, do, they are set on naval attack and rest. So we're leaving this completely up to the commander's discretion. Of course, with naval attack, we cannot pick what we want to attack. Hey, if he wants to go for it, awesome. If not, they're going to sit uh, back here on the Enterprise and hang out. Um, other ships, you know, we have more subs. A lot of these subs we're sending, you know, sub patrol, Honshu. That's heading to the main Japanese island. Sub Patrol, Rabul. We'll talk more about Rabul as we get into Papa. Papa New Guinea, we will set up Papa here at some point. We'll talk about Rabul. But we're sending a, a sub down there because the Japanese will be coming there sooner rather than later. Uh, Brisbane. Now this dolphin is going to go through the Marshall Islands. I thought this was a very nice way that uh, Cole did this. He brings the he brings this ship or the sub that we want to take to Brisbane. But instead of just saying, "Hey, take it to Brisbane," we're going to kind of saunter through the Marshall Islands here. You just never quite know. You might catch a, you might catch a task force that's uh, moving south here. You know, you blow a couple of nice transports out of the water. Then you head to Brisbane. You can have a few more drinks when you get there. Um, this one, uh, the North Marshalls, we've got a lot of sub activity that we'll be putting through these Marshall Islands. So I just kind of want to point those out. Oh, um, while we're talking about carriers, as we did a moment ago, let's talk about the Lexington. The Lexington is very exposed out here. Uh, if we do believe the Japanese task force is here and sailing potentially directly west, the Lexington is in uh, quite a shape out here. Now, we don't have the circles on. Let's put those on. Uh, it will be moving here, then here, you know, in a day. So pulse, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. But it will actually make it to about here. Of course, this is if it was at max speed. It is not. We have it at mission speed. So after this, we resolve this next turn, it will be here um, and moving south. Now, sometimes I will put this at full speed for a turn or two just to make sure it clears. Um, let's do that. You know, this is going to turn red, of course, but... Uh, Last thing you want this thing to do is run out of fuel out here because you just don't have any oil oilers to meet it. <laughs> you know, you just don't have a whole lot to go meet it or things that you can take to go meet it. So, OK, let, let's we'll stay at mission speed. I think we can get clear. This is one turn by two turns. We'll be down here. 
Um, but the, what I did, you know, Cole has this going a little shallower and then turning up immediately. I realize that's because he knows that you're playing the AI and the AI maybe isn't clever enough to come get this sucker, but a good Japanese player knows exactly what you're going to be trying to do with the Lexington out here. Um, and so many times I'll go full speed, full speed and go all the way to Auckland and go go fuel up and then come back you just you know you don't want to lose this carrier this early on um but here i'm going to bring it south i'll bring it down here past canton island up and then back around to pearl harbor then we'll have two and then coming from san diego our third carrier group will have them all together and there is safety in numbers early in the game as the allied player so just wanted to show you what I'm doing there. Uh, I did tell you I wanted to mess around with the Indianapolis here and split this. Uh, I don't want this one to run too long, so I'll just do this on my own. Uh, but I'll just show you how it's done really quickly. Uh, Indianapolis, Southard, and Hopkins, I believe, are going to go meet that Enterprise Task Force that's coming out of San Diego. Or is it, I keep getting that mixed up. Is it the Saratoga or the Enterprise? that's in San Diego. You guys probably know uh, right off the top of your head, but I keep forgetting. It's the Saratoga, okay? So the uh, Indianapolis is gonna go meet the Saratoga with a couple of these destroyer minesweepers. The reason being is the more destroyers we can get out there to the Saratoga, the better. Now, if you've got this situation where you're like, well, I'm out at sea, so I can't disband the task force, all you have to do is hit form new task force and those uh, DMSs, those minesweepers. I can't remember if we're going to do an ASW or not. You just say form a new one. Um, and the three, the Dorsey, the Long, and the Elliot, let's just say it's those three. You just pop them down here and you can form a brand new task force with them. Uh, you know, I'm just going to do this for academic purposes. I'll go back and fix this. But now you see the two different task forces. Here you have the Indianapolis task force, and here you have the other one. So if you ever want to split one out at sea, you just go up to form new task force. So that brings us to what I'll say is the, kind of the final uh, thing I wanted to cover here in this episode, and that is repairs. So you know, we have been hit and hit hard at Pearl Harbor. Uh, there is nothing to be done for the Oklahoma, the Arizona, the West Virginia, or the California. They are going to sink. Uh, float damage, I know we talked about this a little bit, but system damage is really, you know, the systems on the ship. They, they didn't really have computer, obviously they didn't have computers back then, but the systems that ran the ship, back there and it was by steam and by you know uh, I don't know pulleys ropes whatever all the systems of the ship were that ran the ship that's what this damage is float damage is as you can imagine it's taking on water right and this really determines whether it's going to sink or not uh, system damages can it do anything or is it just going to be um, completely unmaneuverable. It can't go anywhere. You can't do anything with it. Now you can see the speed, the top speed listed for these one. If it's one or zero, this thing is going down. Six is bad enough, but we may be able to save that. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but anything 90 or above and float is going to sink. Uh, engine damage, of course, kind of speaks for itself. That's why the speed would be zero. The engines are completely knocked out. Fire, this means this ship is actively on fire right now. You couldn't repair it if you wanted to because it's firefighting. Uh, so, you know, I don't mean to laugh. That sounds horrific uh, if you were on that ship, but they are firefighting. You can't pick a repair. You can't repair a ship that's actively on fire and that's what that 99 fire score is. Um, so, you know, again, Oklahoma, Arizona, California, West Virginia, they're going down. There's just nothing we can do about that, unfortunately. Um, so what do we have left? Well, we have the Nevada here, 
We have the Maryland, which has some damage, but we're just not going to worry about that much. We are going to let that sit uh, in readiness mode. Now, you know, in the basic tutorial, we covered this, but it was kind of fast. It was part of like a half of an episode. Um, there are two main repair types. There is readiness and there is stood down. Okay, so when it says repair type, readiness means that it is being kept ready to immediately leave port and do something. Okay, now it doesn't have to do that and the guys are working on it. The, the ship's crew and potentially any tenders that are here are working on it. Um, but it's going to take 38 days to fix this damage. Now you see we've got a little bit of orange there, some green or green. Good news is we have no major damage. You cannot fix major damage from readiness mode. You can fix this other stuff. And, you know, if it has three, let's say three major, it says here, that does not make the ship inoperable. It doesn't mean you can't go out and do stuff with it. Now, it may hurt some of its stats. It may be a little slower. It may take more fuel. It, you know, maybe it doesn't have as good a maneuverability or whatnot. But it's not fatal, right? But you cannot repair major damage in readiness mode okay but for this 1275 with everything else we have going on here and with the fact that this tonnage is 32,600 we're going to let this repair at the pier readiness okay um now talk speaking of tonnage pearl harbor has a huge capacity for repair in its shipyard 100,000 tons. But as you see, I mean, the Maryland alone, that was 36,000. If we stuff that with the Maryland, uh, you know, we're not quite, we're up, we're 36% of the way there, right? Now, we already have some ships in the December 8th scenario that the computer has put under repair. And let's go look at those. Those are three destroyers, okay? Um, Interesting. I'm not sure why this would, you know, it's got a one zero zero. We can stood down. This does not need to be stood down. Huh, it's locked there. Okay, well, maybe we have to wait for a turn or something. Um, these three destroyers are massively damaged, 75, 77, 58, but they are salvageable and they take up very, very little uh, tonnage. I think these destroyers alone were only 4,000, okay, out of the 6,000. Uh, and so out of 100,000 destroyers like that, even though they're not worth many points, really, in the grand scheme of things. Oh, whoops. Let's go look at this again. Um, I think they're six points a piece, you know. They're not worth that much. Uh, but we need all of the anti-sub that we can get, and they just don't weigh much. And so they're not taking up much space. Uh, and so anyway, we didn't have much of a choice. The computer just put them in repair after December 7th. We need to start hitting back instead of hitting out. Um, so our big question here would be the Nevada, really, in my mind. Pennsylvania and Tennessee, they're fine to do let's see if they have any major damage no uh so you know it's going to take a little while it's going to take uh 30 days but that's okay i mean we've got time uh and it will repair this damage pennsylvania again no major damage so that's fine it can do this kind of uh, readiness repair is the better way to call it because pier side is something different even though this would happen at the pier i'm not going to call it that anymore because that's one of the stood down uh uh sub uh modes we'll get to that in a second okay so let's look at the nevada the nevada is twenty-seven thousand five hundred. it has 35 65 and 15. unfortunately some of this is major right and so you're seeing here, if it stays in readiness mode, 
uh, for its repair, it's going to take, what is that, 83 days. And that's not even going to repair the major stuff, right? The reason you know that is you see the hash there. That hash means that major is not going to get repaired. And that's the case in readiness repair. You know, they're just not able to uh, do that out, you know, with just the ship's crew. So 27 and 5. Okay, not terrible. We can definitely get this repaired at some point. Now, the thing is, is this weighs 27,500 tons. That's going to really start eating into our shipyard repair tonnage. Would we be better off to let the Kitty Butai sail away and get this ship, you know, keep it in readiness, and as soon as they go away, sail it back to San Francisco, where we have all of the tonnage in the world at that shipyard to fix? I'm going to say no, we're not going to do that, at least not immediately. The reason being is the flood damage is 65. Flood damage, now if this was, um, you know, system damage or engine damage, I may think about it, but flood damage is, it's taking on water. And it's not even like it's taking on a little bit of water. At 65, it's taking on quite a bit of water. We cannot afford to have this sink. It's worth 157 points on its own. It's also just a good ship we'd like to have. So for something like this, this would be the only battleship. I would say, let's stand it down and let's send it back to the shipyard. Okay. And so let's look at these modes while we're here. Pier side is pier side, right? That's why I said, I'm going to stop saying pier side because it is one of the sub modes of stood down. Um, and so readiness mode is readiness mode, okay? But once you pick over, pick stood down, you have three options. You can do it at the pier, which still does not fix major damage. You could do it with a repair ship. There are tenders and the ship can come over and help. It still does not repair uh, major damage. Or we can go to the shipyard and you see it's gonna take 117 days, but all of this damage will be repaired. It does eat up 27.5, but I'm okay with that. Okay, so now you will no longer see it on this screen. If we go to ships un under repair, you see it here. Uh, that will also start to make these take longer as we get closer up to that 100,000. You can't go over 100,000, um, but as you get closer to it, it will bump up the number of days this takes. This is really bothering me. Why is this Hirondale here? I guess since it got stood down this turn. Oh my gosh. Okay. We, I totally forgot. We are converting this ship. I was like, why in the world is this here? Uh, this ship had a conversion. I'm not going to talk about that this time. We're going to do that in a future episode where I talk about conversion. Uh, we've already mentioned it a few times, but we are converting this ship into a transport ship because we can. It gave us that option and it's going to take uh, 14 days and we have to do that in the shipyard. Gosh, you know, two or three times, probably somewhere in the comments, someone's going to say, hey man, that's getting converted. Um, but that's why the Hirondelle is back here. It's converting into a transport because we need all the transports we can get. I think this was an AKL before. Uh, we're going to convert that. Some ships have that option and we're gonna take advantage of that. Okay, back to the issue at hand. Those are the only, that is the only battleship we're gonna to send to the repair yard. That means we can take things like the Raleigh, which is a light cruiser, uh, we can send this to the to the repair yard. It has some major damage. Um, and so we're going to send that 7,000 pounds back to, we've now stood it down, back to the shipyard, 28 days, and we will get uh, the equivalent of a brand new ship out of the shipyard. Um, and you see it gets removed from this list. And now we're up to 40,000 tons. Gosh darn it. Um, let's get out of that screen. Let's go to the Helena. The Helena has some major damage. Um, I like to, you know, you can put a lot of these cruisers and light cruisers into the shipyard. They just don't weigh a ton. 
<laughs> no pun intended. Uh, the tonnage here is 10,000. So they do weigh 10,000 tons, not only weighing one ton, 10,000 of them. Um, okay. So now we've got another one here. We're up to 50,000 tons. Oh, I guess when you hit back, it does take you all the way out there. I, got, I kept getting mad at myself for that happening. Let's see if we have any other major damage. Because we may have a situation. Well, let's see. Okay, well we've got uh, we've got this mine layer out here that's got a lot of float damage. Uh, we're not going to mess. We're not going to you know take the time to take a mine layer that's worth six points and put it into the shipyard, uh, but we may stand it down. Is this at readiness? Let's stand it down and keep it at the pier side. Um, that's a I find a, a more quote-unquote serious way of repairing things it takes a little less time um, and we'll do a better job generally uh, let's see so we have the Vestal here uh, let's stand that down at the pier side uh, 48 days and as these things start to repair we may send some of these back to San Francisco oh okay so uh, let's see the Curtis um, Hmm, it's got no major damage. Uh, well, that's a decision. Let's see, we're, oh, we're only at 50,000 pounds, or 50,000 tons. Now I'm thinking maybe, uh, t -t 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 I think maybe we could stand down another battleship. Um, you know, again, these 95s are hopeless cases. Uh, we've got a 12.7, a 14.0, 15.5. Well, I'm going to mess around with that. And when I come back next time, I'll tell you exactly what I did. Now, in the next episode, we are going to be moving away from Hawaii and jumping up to India, which is also a very interesting place to set up. And you'll start to kind of understand the strategy of what we're doing up in that area of the world. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to mess around with this a little bit more. Think a little more deeply than just saying, hey, we're going to throw this thing in the shipyard, uh, you know, because we've got an episode to make. I'm going to think about it. And we'll come when we come back next time. I'll talk about that one. But as always, I have enjoyed the heck out of myself setting this these things up. Uh, hopefully I, you know, explained some things, made you understand some things you didn't before. And uh, it, it helps with your enjoyment of the game or your understanding of the game. So for Strategy Gaming Dojo, if you enjoyed this, you know, give me a subscribe if you haven't already. Probably most of you have, and I do appreciate that. But uh, I am looking forward to doing the next episode, and I will talk to you next time. Thanks.